you guys. Next up we have Liz Moskowitz. Liz Moskowitz is a social documentary photographer and storyteller in Austin, Texas. Born and raised in Brooklyn, great place, New York. She graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a dual degree in English and photojournalism. She likes to read in the sun, eat french fries, and create stuff. Here is Liz. Thanks, Liz. Um, I'm going to read four poems, two that are in here and then two that um, are not. <laughs> ah, okay. The first one is called A Hong Kong Keepsake. I lived in Hong Kong for a year and this is from like a specific moment being there um, and kind of the thoughts going through my head. A Hong Kong Keepsake. I finally thought I had figured it all out. Then I went to the temple of 10,000 Buddhas and drank too many whiskey sodas. My body is a god that punishes. Now, I feel a bit crushed. Not like the style of ice, but like a really heavy Siberian husky happened to fall asleep on my chest. While I'm nursing this Sunday feel, a marching band begins to play. Since I don't know the language, I never know when to celebrate or mourn. People outside my window know exactly where to go. Their footsteps on the pavement like designated raindrops. I'm beginning to feel sentimental. I want to kiss my window or hug my humming fridge. But I'm losing the will to do the unordinary. I'm losing my keys and I'm losing my favorite dress. I'm losing the places I keep things. Does the image of you stay home or linger here in this sentence? Sometimes I find things where they don't belong and keep them there anyway. The sun falls toward me like an orange fist to the head. The smoke from my cigarette touches its light. Now I know this city is a lesson in wanting what you cannot have. Bamboo scaffolding encloses my building the way the rib cage does the heart. I try to close the curtains, but I don't have any. The phone beside me vibrates, and life feels too long, but only for a second. Um, okay, this is one that's not in the book. Um, it also does look really great, by the way. <laughs> I uh, offered a really awesome job. Uh, this is about anxiety. Uh, it's called A Stone Does Not Care What You Think. Imagine an unwanted stone finding its way to a place very deep within you. Once it buries itself, it will grow heavier and you will be asked to describe its color and texture. Sometimes it is a stubborn as steel. Other times it has the texture of a sponge or is like a warm current in your throat moving toward your heart. Almost nothing will rid you of it. Not a well-cooked steak or the joy of hearing a new sound, knuckles cracking underwater. Not the vulnerable love of someone you cannot save or the smell of a sickly sweet flower hanging heavy from its limb. Not a number on a scale or the look of something beautiful you made. Not the news that other lives have been taken away, that over the course of history you are one of the luckiest women to ever live. Not a trip to foreign, faraway countries or the hands of a stranger grazing the outline of your face. To quiet the stone, sometimes a story will do. A heroic cowboy, a disfigured poet, an anxious, frightened girl, unreal and just like you. Or the sound of your father's laughter, a cool bed sheet in a quiet room. The feeling of wind while on the back of a motorcycle, not yet knowing this too will end. I might just actually read through. Okay, so this last one is called An Understanding. Uh, 
My grandma died last January. She was 99 years old, and she was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and this is a poem from my father. It's called An Understanding. Tomorrow, you will receive your mother's ashes in the mail. You already know you cannot look just yet. Bone dust, a mother's life in a black plastic bag will have to wait. A mother who survived Germany's crematorium only to end up like this. It is morbid, but we are good at that. We know it is possible to break our own hearts each and every day. We turn on lights in empty rooms to feel less alone. We count our ribs and pinch our cheeks to remind us that we're still here. We rejoice in the taste of pizza and the look of words on a page. We are made from dust, and to dust we shall return. A prayer from my childhood, murmured in temple alongside you. We are the light and the shadow that finds it. On a sunny afternoon, I stood on our rooftop and watched ashes from burned towers blow playfully in the breeze. We are nothing but the wind that moves us. I make you silly birthday cards, pictures of us floating over skylines and seas. I used to play with sand from your father's grave, kept in a small box in our living room. I pretended it was magic dust. I don't think I ever told you how I watched the grains pour slowly from my fists as I whispered secret spells. A story can be a gentle touch or the mouth of a monster. You give me sepia tone photos of grandma in gilded frames, and I hang them in my room so she and I spend more time together than we ever did before. I am always reminded how fragile we must be to only know ourselves, to still forget who we are. Is Matthew Krauser here? Just real quick, see the current reader. Okay. Then next up then is Shannon Getz. Right, Shannon. Shannon Getz. Uh, <laughs> okay, she's here. Cool. All right, Shannon Getz, Getz lives in Round Rock in a house overflowing with books, stories, imagination, and love with her most fabulous kid and four majestic beasts, two cats, two dogs. She spends her time madly writing writing stories, exhaustively working towards the MFA in creative writing, wonderful, bittersweetly watching and chasing after some majestic beasts to retrieve various objects, pins, flash drive notes, finished drafts, the life plan is world domination. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming out tonight and supporting us, it really means a lot. Um, this. Um, the story is told great white, and it's part of a three-story collection that features a 1940 um, white convertible Cadillac. Um, it's, the car itself is a metaphor for each story's, the characters, their journeys. And so this is the middle story. Um, I think you may see a lot of yourselves in here, especially if you're a young woman with perhaps a domineering mother, or maybe just a dirtbag mother. Take your pick. <coughs> Okay, so, pardon me just a moment. I always get a little too hyperventilated and just gotta calm down just a little bit. Okay. Nina was the first to board the bus. Her only baggage, if you didn't count the lifetime's worth sitting on her shoulders, was a small backpack with an apple, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and an envelope containing three years of waiting sheet tips, minus what her mother had stolen. She settled into the window seat of the right front row. Being close to a uniformed driver made her feel safe. Uniforms had faded largely in her life, particularly those of the Las Vegas PD. It was the social workers and their mix and match that she was afraid of because every time she'd gotten out, they'd put her right back in. Her mother would drive up in that stupid caddy, dressed in her best loving mother outfit, which just like the car, 
was courtesy of some slick haired louse with a fat wallet. The mix and match would believe every fake word and off they drive in the next disaster. Nina learned to keep her head down and keep going. One day, she would get away. As the passengers filed onto the bus, paranoia reared its old and ugly head, prompting her to pull the brim of her ball cap down. She wasn't missing, not exactly. She was 18 and was an adult in the eyes of the law. Her mother's eyes were a different story. They saw her as a burden, as a blame for all of her failures and unhappiness, as a punching bag, as a source of income, and as a host to be fed upon but never as her daughter. Now that dear old mom was getting older and the wallets were losing interest, she was now expected to be her retirement plan. Her mother had taken everything else from her. She wasn't about to let her take her future too. Yeah. Beneath the full moon, the bus rumbled along 915 South. Nina had been planning her escape for years, working crappy jobs, maintaining a perfect yeah. GPA despite being bounced from one school to another. She hadn't told her mother about the full ride to Humboldt State in Northern California. At the first stop in Barstow, she hadn't intended to get off the bus, but the gin-soaked Vegas granny that had taken the adjoining seat wasn't any more sober despite the three-hour nap. As she was helping the woman to her sister's car, she spotted the caddy, the behemoth, 1940 white Cadillac convertible burst from the darkness like a hungry shark from the deep blue depths. Nina wasn't shocked. She wasn't even surprised. Yeah. Her mother had always been a tough one to give the slip. But this time, there was no family court judge forcing her to go back. Her mother, red-faced with anger, stormed towards her. Get in the car, she hissed, grabbing her by the arm. No, Nina said, resting her arm free. I'm leaving, and there's nothing you can do about it. The slap stung no more than usual, and something gave inside. Nina did something she'd never done before. The sound of her open palm connecting with her mother's cheek was like a firecracker going off. It felt so good. She was tempted to do it again. God knows her mother had it coming. Instead, she returned to the bus, leaving her mother gape-mouthed with shock in the middle of the parking lot. Sorry about that, she said to the driver, who was sopping coffee from a shirt which had spilled while he was scrambling to shut the doors against her screeching, charging mother. What is she doing, the driver asked as they watched her mother position herself in front of the bus and only could look at each other as she pounded the grill with her fists. Nina let out an exhausted sigh. It's okay, she said. You can run over her if you want to. <laughs> Nobody will mind. The driver stared at her a few seconds. That bad, huh? Yes. A couple of mechanics in grease-covered overalls drugged her screeching mother away from the bus. Is she going to follow you? The driver asked. Yes, said Nina. In Los Angeles, she transferred bus without incident. Oakland, where she would transfer the bus that would take her to Arcata, home of Humboldt State was a different story. The gun really should not have surprised her. Nina walked toward the caddy with her mother pressing the snub nose 38 into the small of her back and ranting all the while about how ungrateful bitch she was. When they reached the caddy, she gave Nina the keys and ordered her behind the wheel. Nina started the engine and sat with her head contritely bowed. That's a good girl, her mother said as she closed the driver's side door and began making her around behind the car to the passenger seat. Nina counted to three, threw the car in gear and stomped the gas. She didn't look back, not even when her mother started screaming, not even when the first bullet shattered the windshield. She just kept her head down and kept going.